The book of Proverbs, part number 263, chapter 21, God willing, we'll be discussing verses 19 through 21 tonight. Let's read that together. I'll read it out loud. You can read it silently. It says, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness, and honor. So we're going to talk about these three verses tonight. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here tonight. What a joy it is to be in your house. We love you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness and kindness and grace to us. And Lord, I, I thank you for the privilege of preaching, the opportunity to preach your word. And I pray, Lord, for every person here. I pray they'd have ears to hear, heart to receive a mind to comprehend. If anybody among us needs to be saved or needs to be baptized, help them to make those important decisions tonight. But for all of us, Lord, help us to have an attentive heart uh, to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God and let us be willing to do what you want us to do. Bless those who are watching online in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. So we're going to get right in this. we got 13 points to give you, a baker's dozen, and uh, we'll go ahead and get going. Verse 19, it says, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. Um, just a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago maybe, uh, we talked about a verse that was very similar to that earlier in the chapter. I don't have it written on here, but I want to read it for you. Proverbs 21, verse 9, it says, it is better to dwell in, the, in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. So in verse number nine, God says, hey, instead of having a brawling woman in a wide house, it's better for you to sit right on the corner of your housetop and just sit right there and not live with her. And now we see it says it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. So I'm gonna give you one thought about that tonight. Number one, fill in the blanks as we go. Living in peace in the wilderness is far better than in a house with contentions and strife. Living in peace in the wilderness is far better than, a, than in a house with contentions and strife. I cannot tell you how important it is. You may know this from experience, but I cannot emphasize enough how important it is that you have a place that you go to every day that is peaceful. A place that you go that's like heaven on earth. Now, if you have more than one place, great. Maybe church can be that place for you as far as a public place. But at the, at the very least, where you live needs to be a place of peace. It needs to be an opportunity where you go home and you simply don't have to worry about strife and contentions and fighting. Forget your circumstances. You can live in a mansion. You can live in a shack. You can live out in the wilderness. You can live in the corner of a housetop. It don't matter where you live. As long as there's peace, that's something that you can have a place of refuge. A place for you to go where you can get away from the hustle and bustle of life, where you can get away from the attacks of Satan. Wouldn't it be great, and some of you know this by experience, to have a place where you live or where you are where the devil has no room. And that's why the Bible tells us not to give any place to the devil. Give no room to the devil. Don't allow the devil in your home. You need a place where there's no contention, no strife. It's simply peace. Now, all of us have had times in our lives, whether it was when we were children growing up in a home or when we moved out and became young adults and we had roommates or after we got married and had kids of our own, but every one of us knows what it's like to have strife and contention in your home. It's just no fun. When you go to work and you fight with the devil and the world all day long, and then, uh, and then you come home and there's fighting at home, uh, it's almost like there's no rest, there's no escaping it, there's no getting away from it. Often, when people have strife and contention in their home, it drives them to drink alcohol, to do drugs, to maybe have an immoral relationship with, with, with someone that you got no business having that with. 
and it, it drives you to gambling. I mean, it just, it, it, it drives you to suicide. I mean, just all kinds of things. And so there needs to be a place where you have peace. And that's what God's emphasizing here. It's better to dwell in the wilderness and be at peace outdoors in the wilderness than living in a home where there's contention, anger, strife, Always do everything you can within your power to make your home, no matter what circumstances it is, as far as expense, you know, like a shack or a mansion or outdoors or whatever, make sure that your home is peaceful. That's worth it every single day. Living in peace in the wilderness is far better than in a house with contentions and strife. I'd rather be a dollar heir and have peace in my home than be a millionaire and have strife in my home. That's what I'd rather do. There's no amount of money, no amount of money that can pay uh, substitute for peace. There's just no amount of money. So like I said, give me just bare minimums and peace as opposed to wealth and riches and strife and contention every day. Number two, look at verse 20. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. That, that word oil then means essential oils. That's, no, I'm just teasing, no. Um, in, the, in the Bible, uh, oil was a, was a commodity that was used for trade. It was a currency. It was like cash. And so um, all throughout the Bible, it talks about that. And so God says there's treasure to be desired and oil, but where is it? It's in the dwelling of the wise. But the Bible says a foolish man, he'll get treasure, he'll get oil, he'll spend it up. He'll just, just frivolously spend it up foolishly. And uh, there is something to wisdom that is so much better than being a fool. So let me give you seven thoughts tonight about this verse. Number two, write this down, fill in the blanks. There is a reason why wise people gain while foolish people lose. There is a reason why wise people gain and foolish people lose. Now, foolishness can be described or defined as you making foolish decisions. Maybe you're not a bad person. Maybe you love the Lord. Maybe you love people. Maybe you love life, whatever. But you just, you just haven't learned wisdom yet when it comes to life's you know, living with wisdom in life. And you just make foolish decisions. Like if you just continually live in debt, and just accruing more and more debt and just getting more and more debt. Uh, that's kind of foolish. You know, there, I, I know the American way to, to live is, is, you know, you just got to be in debt all the time. But that's just not true. Uh, pay for what you, what you get. Uh, buy your way through life. Don't go into debt. To go into debt is one of the most foolish things you can possibly do. The only time, the only time debt is not foolish is if you have enough collateral on that debt that if you ever sold what you have, you can pay off your debt 100%. All right, so all the debt that my wife and I have combined, all of it combined, wrapped up in our home, if you please, and, and, and what little debt we have, um, if we sold our car, if we sold our house, we would be 100% debt free. What happens is, is if you owe more money than what you can pay for if you had to sell something, that's when it's foolish. That's when it gets into trouble. So debt in and of itself is not bad, but debt without collateral is terrible. And so what happens is if you keep buying things on Amazon, if you keep buying things like cars, if you keep buying things like um, uh, just things that you don't need, but things that you want, and you go into debt, into debt, into debt, into debt, and you have uh, come across a tough time. You know, if you ever lose your job, you ought to be able to sell whatever it is that you have at that moment and pay off all of your debt as opposed to just keep on accruing debt. And so foolishness, the Bible says, spends it up, always has loss. But a wise person always has gain. In other words, it's not talking about being a millionaire, but it's, it's talking about having what you need, being able to live and function in life. If you have wisdom, you know what it is to be able to gain. If you're foolish, no matter what you do, you always spend it up, you lose it, and you don't get to retain it. And so learn the value of wisdom over foolishness. Number three, you cannot do better than the blessing of the Lord. You cannot, that's point number three, you cannot do better 
than the blessing of the Lord. Look at Proverbs 10, verse 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. Now, that word rich can be defined in many different ways. Being rich, does, again, doesn't mean that you're a millionaire, but it means that you have more than you need. That's really the definition of what it means to be rich. You have more than you need. You have excess. You have money that you can, or possessions or things that you can share and give to others and give away. Uh, to be rich, again, it's not a dollar amount, but to be rich is to simply have more than you need. Now, um, so what happens is God says the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow to it. So this and this, you cannot do better than the blessing of the Lord. If you would have the blessing of the Lord, it would make you rich and you would not have guilt or shame or sorrow associated with him. So in other words, when you get uh, the blessing of the Lord, God provides for you and you don't have to feel bad about it. I remember when my wife and I first got our home, um, you know, we, would, we, would, we were genuinely concerned what people would think about us because of the nice house that God has allowed us to live in. And I know that when we got the house, I, nobody said anything directly to our face, but I know that there would be some Christians that would say something like this, it ain't right that pastor has such a nice house. Well, you know what? I, I've been serving faithfully for the Lord for 25 and a half years. Uh, my wife and I, we looked at our, our giving last year. We gave $30,000 to the Lord in the offering plates last year. It was the highest dollar amount that my wife and I have given to the Lord since I became the pastor of this church. So for 25 years of pastoring, you know, we've never given more than that. But we gave $30,000 to the Lord and to missions and, you know, all of it added up, um, $30,000. And we did not make $300,000 last year, not even remotely close, not even close. But the blessing of the Lord. God has given us such a wonderful, wonderful house. I remember years ago when I would get a new car, whether it be brand new or just new to me. Um, there would always be some grumbling. Somebody would say something, you know, uh, about me getting another car. As if, you know, I mean, me having a car that I can depend on to get from point A to point B was a bad thing. Well, that's not a bad thing. And again, I, I have tithed ever since I was 17 years of age. I have given to missions the majority of those years uh, on top of tithing. And um, I have earned, or if you please, um, done what is necessary to garnish the blessing of the Lord on my life. And it's not just financial blessing. You know, the Bible talks about rebuking the devourer. In other words, the things in your life that devour your time, devour your money, that, that, that just suck life out of your life, and on and on and on. God says the blessing of the Lord, God will rebuke the devourer. And um, sometimes the blessing of the Lord is not what God directly gives to us, but it's what God protects us from. You know, for 25 and a half years, I've never had to be in the hospital myself. My wife, has, has the only time she's ever been in the hospital is to give birth. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's the only time. We had, we had um, we, all five of our boys, God has really, the whole time they grew up in our home, and even to this day, nobody's ever been seriously hurt. Uh, uh, David had stitches on his forehead when he was young one time because he fell into the corner of a brick wall there and, and, got, and cut his forehead. And uh, Joseph just had just uncomfortable teeth, bad teeth. He had to have dental surgery at a young age, and he had to be, you know, you know get kind of put to sleep or uh, put out. And then they removed four of his teeth, and, and then he, you know, woke up, and two or three hours later, and we got to bring him home. But uh, Stephen spent four nights, four nights, uh, Monday through Friday, in, uh, in a hospital. He had RSV when he was a month old. And, uh, but other than that, other than that, man, I mean, we're talking 25 and a, well, technically 27 and a half years, almost 28 now, of marriage. And how much God has been so good to us. I mean, God has been so good to us. Can I tell you something? There is nothing that can take the place of the blessing of the Lord. Nothing. It makes you rich. Now, again, rich. More than you need in order to live. That's the definition of rich. It's not being a millionaire. It's not being a billionaire. It's simply more than you need. You not only have enough, but you have more than enough. That's what it talks about in Psalms where it says, my cup runneth over. 
my cup runneth over. That means I have more than enough. Now, the only time I don't like my cup running over is if I've got coffee in it. And then, I, then all that coffee goes on the counter and I have to not drink it. I have to wipe it up and kind of not get to enjoy it. But other than coffee running over, I sure do love it when God allows my cup to run over. So you cannot do better than the blessing of the Lord. America needs to wake up and realize that. We as a country will never do better <clears throat> than the blessing of the Lord. Why are we pushing God out of our society? Why are we pushing God out of our country? We are. It's terrible. It's wrong. Do we feel in America today that we are full of the blessing of the Lord? Not at all. I feel a nation full of anger and strife, not getting along, death, murders, and um, godlessness. I mean, it's all over our country. And uh, liberals want to tell us, the best way to fix it all is to pass new laws. And that's simply not, uh, raise taxes. Pass laws and raise taxes, and everything will get better. Uh, no, it won't get better until we get the blessing of the Lord on our country. You know, we sing that song, God Bless America, land that I love. I, listen, I want God to bless America. But in order for God to bless America, we have to earn his blessing. We have to do what is necessary in order for God to provide his blessing. And I'm going to tell you something. There's no comparison. I don't care what it is. When you or we as a country, when you as a family, when you as an individual experience the blessing of the Lord on your life, it makes you rich, and, and it says he addeth no sorrow with it. Number three, number four, a righteous life is far better than a wicked life. A righteous life is far better than a wicked life. Look what it says, Proverbs 15, 6. In the house of the righteous is much treasure, but in the revenues of the wicked is trouble. Now listen carefully. It doesn't say wicked people have no revenue. It just simply says troubles with it. So I would much rather have the treasures of a righteous life and not live in a wicked lifestyle than to have revenues from being wicked because trouble is associated with it. A righteous life is far better than a wicked life. Now, what's a righteous life? Just basically living life like God tells us to live. Living by the golden rule, living by the Ten Commandments, living by the Word of God, um, doing what the things that God tells us to do, not doing the things that God tells us not to do. Listen, you live a righteous life, the Bible says there's much treasure. You live a wicked life, sure you're going to get revenues, but you're going to get a whole lot of trouble. At the very least, the trouble you get is going to be when you stand before God. At the very least, for your wickedness. Chances are you're going to have a lot of trouble in this life as well. So you just, can't, you just can't beat righteousness. A righteous life is far better than a wicked life. Number five, I love this. Your life will always be blessed if you fear the Lord. Your life will always be blessed if you fear the Lord. Look at Psalms 112, verses 1 through 3. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments, his seed shall be mighty upon earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Look what it says. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. All right, so it all starts with this in verse 1. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. That's what it starts with. When you fear the Lord, listen, too many of us, man, alive. I mean, honestly, we do not fear God like we should. Case in point is when you make a decision in life of any importance, when you just don't even regard what God has to say about it, you just do what you think is right or what makes sense to you. You have no fear of God. So what happens is when you fear God, before you make any decision of importance, before you do things in life, you say, God, what do you think about this? Is this good to do? Is there something I could do differently? Is there a better way to look at it? God, your opinion matters to me. That's what it means to fear the Lord. Then secondly, it also means you, you're afraid of his power as far as disappointing him and getting punished by him. God does have a paddle, and when he spanks, it hurts. And you ought to fear that. I mean, again, you don't have to live your life just being afraid of God all the time. But, but when, you know, like, like, okay, if you're a loving parent and you have a toddler, you will teach them 
do not stick your fingers in the electrical socket. That's what you'll teach your toddler. If, you're, if your toddler is going right to the electrical socket, if you're a smart parent, if you are a loving parent, if you're a parent that wants your child not to have pain and suffering in life, you'll slap their hand. Don't let social services know. But anyway, you'll, you'll slap their hand. Don't do that. That's wrong. Any, 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 any. Any counselor, social service worker, anybody that says you got to go to every child that you have and treat them like an adult their entire, entire childhood. They got a hole big enough to drive 10 semi trucks through their head. A hole in their head big enough for 10 semi trucks. You can't look at a two year old and talk to them like a, like a child, like, like an adult. You, you got you to gotta get them to understand the word no. And if you slap their, why? Okay, great. Th then feel like slapping their hand or spanking them is cruel, so just let them stick their finger in the electrical socket. I mean, whatever, right? But what God does in love, he looks at us, and he says, don't do this. It's going to be bad for you if you do it. And if you do it, he's going to spank you, discipline you. The Bible's word is chasing you. Guess what? If you fear God, you don't want God to have to spank you. You want to just simply live right. You want to just simply do right so God doesn't have to come down from heaven and spank you because his paddle is a whole lot bigger than our paddles. And uh, I, I remember when, I, was, when um, I grew up and I got to visit my grandparents in Anderson, Indiana, they had this huge tree in the front yard. But for some reason, that huge tree never got a whole lot of leaves on it. It's because the children and grandchildren are always having to go out there and pull off a, a, a stick or a twig or to, to get spanked with. <laughs> and it just never had time to fully develop, you know, and uh, the spanking tree. I remember when my kids used to be in, my, in our car, we'd drive around town. Y'all know what weeping willows? We used to call them spanking trees. And uh, our kids would say, what, what kind of trees? Oh, that's a spanking tree. They're weeping. That's a, that's a spanking tree. You know, so every time they'd see a weeping willow, they'd, ooh, there's a spanking tree, you know. But, uh, but the fact of the matter is, if you fear God, you're going to have blessings. It says, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. Then it says, your seed, that's your children, will be mighty upon the earth. Uh, the generation upright, the whole generation will be blessed. And then it says, wealth and riches shall be in your house. And your righteousness will endure forever. Now, who wouldn't want that? That doesn't sound like a bad deal. You fear God, this is what he offers you. So, your life will always be blessed if you fear the Lord. Number six, wisdom will always produce life. Wisdom, number six, will always produce life. Look at Ecclesiastes 7, verses 11 and 12. It says this, watch this now. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it, that's wisdom, there's profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. So you know what God says? Yes, wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But God says here, wisdom is a whole lot better than defense, than money. Because wisdom gives life. Money doesn't give life. Money, you cannot buy happiness with life. But you can get happy or have an enjoyable life with wisdom. So point number six, wisdom will always produce life. Two, ways, uh, uh, two definitions of wisdom. Number one, seeing life from God's point of view. Uh, number two, uh, having some sense and knowledge of common sense when it comes to living your life. Those are the two aspects of, of wisdom, seeing life from God's point of view. Number two, applying common sense to life. When you learn something, put it to practice. That's wisdom. That's understanding how life is supposed to be. For example, if you wanna have a place to live, be sure and pay your mortgage or pay your rent. Don't spend your rent money and your mortgage money on um, vacations and partying and, and things that are frivolous in life. I mean, obviously, if you want food in, in, your, in your cupboards in, in, and you have money, then don't spend your money on lottery tickets. Don't go to Black Hawk and, and, uh, and gamble and, and don't be foolish with going into debt. And then guess what? You'll most likely have groceries in your home and things like that. And um, there's a way to be wise. And then secondly, seeing life from God's point of view, man, don't, don't ignore God when it comes to the way you live your life. Look at life as God sees life and do the things that God would do if you're in your shoes and you'll, it'll always produce life for you. Next, number seven. Oh, I love this. Always live for the treasures of heaven. Always live 
for the treasures of heaven. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, it says, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. That literally means don't do it. That's what it means. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, let me stop and say something about that. I have an insurance policy on my life for, for my wife in case something were to happen to me. All right, now it's a half a million dollar insurance policy. When April comes, it's going to be transferred over to a, a million dollar insurance policy. My wife is saying, honey, please do not die in the next three months. That's what she's saying. Wait till after April to die because there'll be a million dollars instead of a half a million dollars. But uh, I had term life insurance that uh, lasted for uh, 30 years, 30 years. And uh, I was only paying $28.48 a month for 30 years to have a half a million dollar life insurance. Now I'm going to up it to a million dollar life insurance, but uh, because I'm older, I don't know why they think that's relevant, but because I'm older, now the premium's going up. I think it's going to be about like $170 a month or something like that, $120, $140 a month, something like that. Uh, but at any rate, to be able to save or to secure money to provide for your family or spouse or children. That's not what this is talking about. What this, someone owes the preacher a Starbucks gift card and I want it after the service. That's what I want. All right. But, um, uh, but the fact of the matter is what this is saying is just to stockpile treasures on earth. You're foolish for doing that. Why do you have, why do you lay up treasures on earth? What? He who dies with the most toys wins? Huh? He who dies with the most toys loses all of his toys to other people that are left on earth alive. You ain't taking the toys with you to heaven. The, the goal is not to stockpile treasures on earth. What the, what's the point of that? God says if you lay up treasures upon earth, moth and rust will corrupt it, moth and rust will corrupt it, and uh, thieves could possibly break through and steal. Why would you put treasures on earth? Why would you do that? You're a child of the king. You're a child. You're going to heaven one day. Don't lay up treasures on earth. Lay up treasures in heaven. No, no moth nor rust will corrupt it. No thieves are going to break through and steal. If you're going to lay up treasures, lay up treasures in heaven. Don't invest in this, in this life only. You invest in this life only. When you die, you ain't taking it with you. And so God always live for treasures of heaven. You know, here's what y'all do. You ready for this? This is a great way to live. This could be a great New Year's resolution. Even though it's not New Year's 1st, uh, January 1st, it's, it, you can start now. But do this. Say, every single day of my life, I want to do something that makes eternity better. Something. Every day of your life. It could be soul winning. It could be passing out a gospel track. It could be praying for others instead of praying for yourself. It could be tithing. It could be given to missions. I mean, there's all kinds of ways that you can lay up treasures in heaven. All kinds of ways that you can make decisions and make actions that profit heaven more than it does this earth. But every single day of your life, if you can say, I just want to do one thing today, at least one thing today, that benefits eternity. That's a great way to live, laying up treasures in heaven. Number eight, foolish living will cause you to be in want. Foolish living will cause you to be in want. Case in point, the prodigal son. Luke 15, verses 11 through 16, it says this, and he said, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them, of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me, and, divide, and he divided unto them his living. What a sad thing. The son said to the dad, I can't wait till you die, dad, to get my inheritance. Could I have it now? That's basically what he said. Divide unto us the portion, uh, uh, our inheritance. Look what it says, verse 13. And not many days after, that means it wasn't years later, it was just many days. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country. And there, look what it says, wasted his substance with riotous living. He was foolish with how he lived. And when he spent all, not even a little bit was left over, he spent it all. There arose a mighty famine in that land because there always is a famine that comes around every so often. And it says this, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, a friend that he made that had nothing to do with his father or his family or God, and sent him, this is what his citizen did, 
sent him into his fields to feed swine. That's pigs. Now watch this. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. How did he get to this point of being in want and nobody given to him? He was extremely foolish with the way he lived. He wasted his substance in riotous living, all the party life, all the evil and the wicked of this world. Just wasted all of his stuff, all of his possession, all of his inheritance, gone. And when he had wasted it all, he started saying, man, I wish I had a place to live, wish I had some food to eat, wish I had something just to survive. And he went to a citizen, a friend that was in the world of that country. He said, well, can, can you help me? He said, sure, go out there and feed my pigs. And when they get done eating, you can eat what's left over. And that's what he did. And he sat there. And he, it says he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. Pig's food, after they ate, by the way. That's what will always happen to you if you live your life in foolish living. Please don't be a fool. When the pastor stands up and preaches, when the youth pastor stands up and preaches about what the dangers of this world are, please don't minimize what we say. Don't look at us and say, oh, you just don't want us to have fun. Yeah, yeah, you go be promiscuous. In, in, in your morals, and you, you might get AIDS. You might get some type of crippling disease that's going to affect you for the rest of your life. Yeah, I'm dumb. Save yourself for who you're going to get married to. That's the best way to be. Yeah, I'm dumb. But yeah, you go out and live in, in promiscuous lifestyle, and guess what? You never know what's going to happen to you, what bad is going to happen to you. You've got to understand it. God's laws of reaping and sowing are real. You live righteously, God blesses you. You live wickedly, then at the very least you get punished, maybe even cursed with something really bad. I'm up here standing, you know, the bridge is out. Don't go down that road. Oh yeah, the bridge is out. I'll bungee jump it. I'll, I'll hop over it. I'll, I'll have fun. And you just mow right on past, and you just head on down that road. Next thing you know, it, the bridge is out, and you wreck your car. You wreck your life. You're down in the dumps. You're down on the bottom. Why? Because you didn't heed the warning sign. When someone stands up and says, hey, bridge is out. Don't go down this road. It doesn't mean they don't want you to have fun. It means they want you to avoid danger. That's all. Foolish living will cause you to be in one. Verse 21. Last verse. In Proverbs chapter 21, we're going to give you five thoughts underneath of it, but look what it says. He that followeth after righteousness and mercy, look what it says, findeth life, righteousness, and honor. Let me ask you a question. What are you following tonight? What are you following? Who and what are you letting lead you? Let me give you five thoughts about that. Number nine, follow after righteousness. Follow after righteousness righteousness the way of the wicked is an abomination unto the lord but he loveth him that followeth after righteousness let me ask you a question do you just want the love of god to be all over your life do you want the love of god just to be flowing to you and everywhere you go you just you live in the love of god i'm not saying god doesn't love people and he'll stop loving them that's why the bible says in the book of jude keep yourselves in the love of god so the love of god is flowing from heaven to earth for you and god loves you but you got to keep yourself in that love how do you do that it says here he loveth him god's talk uh, the way of the wicked is an abomination of the lord but he loveth him god loveth him that followeth after righteousness if you live in a wicked, bomb, a, a wicked lifestyle, God says you're an abomination to me. Do you think that's a good thing? It's not frivolous. It's not something like, oh, hey, I'm an abomination to God. Give me a t-shirt, I'll wear it. Abomination to God. Um, Sodom and Gomorrah didn't think so well after fire and brimstone rained down from heaven upon them. There was no t-shirts being sold that day. We're an abomination to God. Now you got fire and brimstone consumed you on one day. Uh, that's not what you want. Um, and plus, if you get that, the love of God just all throughout your life, it says he loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Who are you following? Follow after righteousness. Number 10, follow on to know the Lord. Follow on to know the Lord. Hosea 6, verses 1 through 3, look what it says. Come and let us return unto the Lord. That means if you're away from God, return. I love it when people 
have, who have left our church want to come back. People who have gone into the world or left the will of God for their life realize they made a mistake and they want to come back. Let Hopewell always be a church where people that have gone away can come back. Amen? I don't want you to go away, but if you do, you always have a place to come back to. And that's what it says. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Watch this. For he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. In the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then, ready, shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. His going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. It says in verse 3, then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord. You know what God says? You'll know that life is great. You'll know the blessings of the Lord are wonderful if you follow on to know the Lord. Who are you following tonight? Are you following the world? Are you following after money? Are you following after the wicked of the world, the, the, the famous people of the world, the movie stars, the athletes, the rock stars? Who are you following? Well, follow on to know the Lord. Then you'll know that life is worth living. Then you'll know the blessing of the Lord. Then you'll know how wonderful life can be if you follow on to know the Lord. There's so many people that believe in God, but they really don't know him. See, how do you know? Because I know by the things they say. They say things that God hates. And yet they say, oh, I know God. You know, I believe in the Lord. But, but you know, <laughs> but, but you live in a lifestyle and do things that God hates? You don't really know God. If you really knew God, you would, knew what, you would know what he loves and what he hates. And if you really knew the Lord, you'd want to live in what he loves and avoid what he hates. Number 11. I love this. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Someone uh, just reads, uh, it says in Matthew 5, 6, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. One of the blessings of Christmas is I had some church members that gave us um, some gift cards and some different people that gave us some gift cards. And so I've got a gift card in my wallet for Outback Steakhouse. I got a gift card in my wallet right now for Red Robin. I got a gift card in my wallet for uh, Chipotle and maybe even a fourth gift card. I can't remember now. Everyone, you know, people usually give me a gift card for Starbucks and things like that. And so I got some of those already. But so today I, 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 was, I was coming back from the Capitol dropped Benjamin off at home, and I was driving into Longmont, and I was pretty hungry. I, I skipped breakfast this morning. All I had was two cups of coffee. I mean, at least I had two cups of coffee, you know. But it's like 12.30, 12.45. I'm not starting to get hungry. And so I said, well, what am I going to do? And Red Robin was calling. I thought, oh, man, I'd love to go to Red Robin and get that, that uh, uh, hamburger, you know, $6 burger, whatever you call it, and uh, bottomless fries. And, but then I was running late on time, and then I thought, hey, maybe that'd be a good date night for my wife and me on Friday night. Maybe while, the, while Jack's at RU, I can just sort of take my wife, and we can go on the town and go to Red Robin, you know. So I, I saved that gift card, and I went to Chipotle. And uh, got a burrito and came back to my office and ate it. And, uh, but you know what? I was hungry this, this afternoon. And I got filled with Chipotle. You know what God says? He says, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, your life will be filled. I mean, you won't look at life and say, oh, man, I wish I was a different person. Are you listening? Wake up. I, was a, I wish I was a different person. I wish I had a different life, a different house, a different family, a different church. No. If you hunger and thirst after righteousness, God says, I'll fill you. I'll fill your life. You'll be satisfied. You won't want another life. I don't want a movie star's life. I don't want a professional athlete's life. I don't even want a millionaire's life. I am completely filled with the life that God has given me to live. And you know what? That's all I need. I just need to be filled, and God has done that. Hunger and thirst after righteousness. Number 12. We only got two more points, and we'll be done. Flee from the love of money. That's point 12. Flee from the love of money. 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 12, look what it says. But they that will be rich, that means those people that 
want to be rich. Look what it says, fall. Every person that wants to be rich, you're going to fall. How? Fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For, ready? The love of money is the root of all evil. It doesn't say money's the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil, which, while some coveted after, guess what they've done? They have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. He's saying flee the love of money. Don't ever love money. And follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. What God is saying to the man of God here is flee the love of money. Don't live your life wanting to be rich. If God allows you to be rich, praise God. But don't you ever wake up a single day in your life saying, I hope I get rich. Because if you do, if you want to be rich, you will fall into temptation, snare, foolish and hurtful lust. You'll drown in destruction and perdition. You'll, you'll uh, err from the faith and pierce yourselves through with many sorrows. If you love money and you want to be rich. So here's what God says, flee it. Flee it. You know, Solomon became the wealthiest man that ever lived. But you know what? When God said to him, ask me what you will, and I'll give it to you. He didn't ask God for money. He didn't. He said, God, he goes, I'm a young man, and I've just been made king over Israel, and I don't know how to be king. I'm in my 20s. He said, would you give me wisdom? That's all I want from you, God, is wisdom. God said, boy, will I ever give you wisdom? Sure, but I'm so impressed that you didn't want long life or wealth or the, the life of your enemies. He goes, here's what I'll do. I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you all the money that you could ever, your hearts could ever desire. You'll be the wealthiest man in the world. I'll give you a long life, and I'll make sure you never go to war, and no, no enemies of Israel will ever come at you in war, all because you wanted wisdom. Solomon became the wealthiest man in the world, but he didn't want it. If God can trust you with money he'll give you some but if all you do is want to be rich and you love money then god says i can't trust you with that you're going to fall in temptation snares all that stuff number 13 last in heaven you will not be sorry you followed the lord in heaven you will not be sorry you followed the lord look what it says there in second timothy chapter 4 verses 7 and 8 look what it says 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8 says, I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You know what? When you die and stand before the Lord, will you have said like Paul, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. If you've lived for God, listen to this, in heaven you'll not be sorry that you followed the Lord. But if you don't follow, your, follow the Lord, if you don't live your life for God when you get to heaven, probably you're going to look back at your life and say, I blew it. I blew it. I had a chance to make a difference in this world, and I lived for something that was temporal and not for something that was eternal. Please make sure you follow the right person. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening.